Hello, everybody. My name is Earl Hirsch from the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. And I have the opportunity today to talk to you about striking the spiking as far as blood sugar spikes are concerned. Now, there are a lot of reasons why this spike after eating is important. First, it may increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. A lot of controversy on this, but much of the literature does support this. It makes many people feel bad, especially people under good control. But what's really interesting, and this study has never been done in type 1 patients, but in type 2 patients, it is a greater contributor to hemoglobin A1C, at least for those people with lower A1C levels. This was a study done in 290 people with type 2 diabetes. And you can see in the graph, on the left side of the graph, those are people with A1C levels under 7.3%. And what you can see in the white is that the high spikes of the glucose are responsible for about 70% of the A1C for those people with low A1C levels. Whereas if you look at those people with very high A1Cs on the right side, A1Cs above 10.2, the spikes have very little impact, and the black bar in that graph has to do with fasting glucose. So for those high A1Cs, the fasting is the most responsible for the A1C, whereas with the low glucose, the fasting has minimal impact, and it's all about the after-meal blood sugar spike. So how do we strike the spike down? This is what everybody tries to deal with. Well. The first has to do with timing. I've been calling this lag time for about 30 years. And the good news about timing is it's often inconvenient, but on the other hand, it doesn't cost you anything, um, depending on how much your time is worth. These are two studies. On the left, it's with Lyspro, which is Humalog. On the right, it's Glulysine, which is Apidra. These are fast-acting mealtime insulins. And what you see on both of these with the yellow circle, excuse me, the white circle, is that's what happens when you don't wait or you give the glucose after you eat. You can see with Lyspro, the green line, that's what happens if you give the insulin 30 minutes before eating. You don't have any spike at all. And with the Apidra on the right side, if you give the insulin 20 minutes before eating, you also don't have any spike. So the timing has a huge impact on having a spike or not. So here's an interesting case. The blood sugar is 152. Normal dose of insulin for meals in this individual is 10 units. How much time to wait to minimize the after meal spike since that's what the goal here is? Well, there are several ways to do this. And I think it's important to think about the trend arrows. Now, the two most commonly used continuous glucose monitors, Dexcom and the Abbott Libre, have published criteria on what these arrows mean. And you can see that if the arrow is going up at 45 degrees, 90 degrees, or going up at 90 degrees with two arrows up, that's what you really don't want to deal with when you're about to eat, because that means it's going up at three points per minute. You see the same thing coming down. And the point is you need to take into consideration these arrows when you're also taking into consideration the lag time. We see the similar type of arrows with the Abbott Libre or the Libre 2. And again, the point is you would at the very least like that arrow to be flat if not going down when you're about to consume the meal. So let's look at this situation. The blood sugar is 154. The normal dose is 10 units. But now the arrow is going straight up. So it's going up at two points per minute. How much time to wait to maximize or really minimize the spike after eating? So Therapy changes are based on the trend of the blood glucose. The main tools to reduce it, which everybody should think about, is number one, the time. You're going to wait longer when that arrow is going up like that. You're going to give correction dose insulin. 
Now the insulin is relatively slow. And so because of that, it's probably as important to give that more time than to give correction dose, but you're probably gonna do both. But there is a third one, and that third one is very important, and we will get to that in a minute. But here are the bottom line pearls for reducing the spike. Number one, again, is time. With an up arrow, you will often need to wait 20 to 30 minutes. But in general, what the rule is, you want that trend arrow to be flat. You don't want to have that trend arrow going up when you're about to eat a meal that is high in carbohydrate. As far as correction dose insulin is concerned, everybody should have a specific sensitivity factor. Many prefer not to use much correction insulin and only use time when possible. That's not always possible. And the warning is using correction insulin with much added time will often lead to hypoglycemia. So you have to be careful when you're adding 15 or 30 minutes and you're giving correction insulin. Often you don't need to do both, but if you do, you need to watch the CGM because you want to make sure that after eating, hypoglycemia does not occur. What is the third tool to reduce the spike? And actually, I think this may be the most important tool, exercise. Exercise will clearly reduce the spike, and there has been tremendous research into how exercise does this. And here's the bottom line from a lot of exercise research. These two bullet points is all you really need to know. If one exercises after the meal, when the insulin is peaking, this will bring the blood sugar down quickly to strike the spike. You will not have much of a spike if you do this. Now, there's a little bit of trial and error. Uh, some people, it's just a brisk walk for seven minutes. Other people do more, other people do less. But you can see, based on how much insulin is in your blood and how much carb you ate, what you need to strike the spike. But here's the more interesting part. If the blood sugar is high before the meal, if you exercise before the meal, you will reduce the glucose level both before the meal and the after meal glucose. You will improve both of them if you exercise prior to the meal. And so the timing of the exercise is also obviously important. Now, some more pearls for striking the spike safely using CGM or continuous glucose monitoring. You need to use caution with these three tools that we're talking about. You need to watch the CGM when combining these longer lag, time, lag times with the correction doses and exercise, whether you're exercising before or after the meal. Secondly, even temporarily, it is reasonable to set a higher alarm than usual to protect against hypoglycemia, especially, for example, if you are exercising either before or after the meal, you're using a longer lag time, and you're using correction dose insulin, you may want to move that alarm on your CGM from 70 to 80 or from 80 to 90 to make sure you don't get into trouble with hypoglycemia. But you need to be careful. When you have these arrows going down, you don't want to use a 15 or 30 minute lag time with these arrows going down because this is a situation that you will clearly get hypoglycemia if you use too much time. What may be the most important tool to strike the spike? We've talked about a bunch of them already. It's what you eat, low carb. With this particular meal, there will be minimal, if any, spike. And the people who are very careful with eating low carb, and we're not talking keto diets, we're just talking about minimizing the carb. The insulin isn't fast enough. If you're gonna be eating 60, 70, 80, 100, 120 grams of carbohydrate, which I see all the time, if you're gonna do that, there is really no way to strike the spike simply because the insulin isn't fast enough to deal with that carbohydrate load. And if you just think about it for a moment, somebody without diabetes, they don't get a spike when they eat that amount of carbohydrate because the insulin from their own 
beta cells in their pancreas goes directly to the liver where all the action is done. But when you give an injection or a bolus of insulin for it to get to the liver or to the muscle, it takes a long time. And if the carbohydrate load is peaking in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and your insulin isn't peaking for an hour, an hour and a half, you're just not gonna make it when you eat a high carbohydrate meal. Other mealtime insulins to strike the spike? Well, Lumjev is our newest rapid acting, or I, I should say ultra rapid acting insulin. This comes from Eli Lilly. It is a cousin of Humalog, and a couple of chemicals were added to it to make it faster. And in fact, the research shows that. This is a study on type one diabetes with pumps. And in the red, what you see is the Lumjev postprandial spike, and it's less at zero to one hour and zero to two hours. And more good news, when you look at hypoglycemia under 70, the Lumjev did a better job in this, in this study. You have less hypoglycemic exposure under 70. So that's the good news. The URLI stands for ultra rapid acting Lyspro compared to Lyspro, which is Humalog. So here's the not so good news about Lumjev. There was no difference in time and range, whether looking at the daytime, the nighttime, or overall, no difference in hemoglobin A1C. It's really here all about these postprandial spikes, but this drug, this insulin will reduce the postprandial spikes. Turns out, and I'm just not gonna go through it, we have similar data with FIASP, which is the Novo Nordisk fast-acting insulin, where we have lower postprandial spikes, but no differences in time and range or in hemoglobin A1C. What about Afraza? Um, Afraza is really amazing because of how fast it is. It is an inhaled insulin. More and more patients are using this with automated insulin delivery that they are using when they do get into a high blood sugar quickly. And in fact, if you look at the insulin action comparing Humalog with the Fraza, it's really impressive. Um, this is Humalog or Lyspro, and you can see with a typical eight unit bolus, what you see is that it lasts for six hours. Now this is not measuring the insulin level in the blood. This is measuring the insulin action. And very briefly, what this is, is that a shot of eight units of Humalog was given, and the patient was hooked up to an IV, and glucose was infused into the vein to keep the blood sugar steady at 100. And you can see that with typical Humalog, the peak is 90 minutes to two hours, and it's pretty much gone by five to six hours. And that's the insulin action time we talk about in pump patients. I also want you to note that when you're giving 30 units or 90 units of Lyspro or Humalog, you obviously have a higher peak, but more importantly, the bigger the dose, the longer the duration of the insulin. And for some patients who are overweight or obese, this is really important because if you're taking 20 or 30 units of Humalog, that insulin is lasting quite a long time. Now that's Humalog, Let's take a look at a Fraza. TI is technosphere insulin, and I want you to look at 10 units of technosphere insulin. It is completely gone at two hours. In fact, most of it is gone at 90 minutes. And even the 30 unit dose and the 120 unit dose um, does not really have a prolonged duration compared to what we see with injectable Humalog. So a very good way to strike the spike is with a Fraza. And in fact, that's what the studies show. The orange is rapid acting insulin. The purple is a phrase of patients. And we are looking at the post meal glucose levels. And when it says compliant, and I hate that word, compliant is the word that was used by the study investigators, meaning because the aphrasia works so quickly, after the meal, if the patient saw the glucose level trending upward with a higher protein or higher fat meal, 
they would actually give an extra inhalation of the aphrasia. And for the people who did that, you can see the postprandial spikes at breakfast, at lunch, were lower. They tended to be lower at dinner. It didn't hit statistical significance, but you can see the data very clearly. The aphrasia works, but you have to be watching the sensor for the higher protein fat meals. What are other ways we can strike the spike? Well, there's adjuvant drugs. For example, Similin. Now, Dr. Edelman and I have a lot of experience with Similin, but we just don't use it anymore. And we don't use it for a few reasons. It's three injections per day. It does strike the spike. Um, it did cause some nausea, which usually went away. But what many of us saw over the course of one to two years is the drug stopped having its effectiveness. Having said that, this is the only additional drug that is currently approved for the treatment of type 1 diabetes other than insulin. What about GLP-1 receptor agonists? Ozempic is one of many on the, on the uh, market right now. It is not FDA approved for type 1 diabetes, at least not yet. We are hopeful that one of these drugs eventually is. They are tremendous drugs for controlling glucose. We see tremendous weight loss with these drugs, but we also strike the spike with the people who take this drug or this class of drugs. And the reason for that is the drug also delays gastric emptying. Well, think about that for a moment. If this drug does that, you might not want to use this drug in somebody who already has that with gastroparesis, which unfortunately we still see quite a bit of. And then the third drug that we can add are these SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, Jardiance and Farsiga are the two that are most commonly used in type 2 diabetes, but like the GLP-1 drugs, these drugs are not yet approved for type 1 diabetes. And the main reason for that is these drugs also can cause ketoacidosis without the blood sugar going up. And that's obviously scary. Um, these drugs work by making you lose more glucose in your urine. But what's been most interesting about these drugs, and we think just like with type 2 diabetes, we would see this in type 1 diabetes, is they are very good for people with kidney disease, very good for people with heart disease, and very good for people with heart failure. Yet the ketoacidosis up until now has not allowed us to use these drugs with FDA approval here in the United States. So I would like to conclude that striking the spike is important in type 1 diabetes, especially for those with lower A1C levels, because if you already have an A1C of 7.3 or below, that's the low hanging fruit of something you can actually strive for to improve. Judicious use of lag time, correction doses, and CGM use in addition to exercise, can all be quite helpful. Faster-acting insulins can also be helpful, but CGM use is mandatory. And I would actually say CGM use is really mandatory in anybody with type 1 diabetes, and I would actually take it a step further, and the new ADA guidelines support this, people with type 2 diabetes on basal insulin alone, I would say it is mandatory. Adjuvant drugs can be helpful, and hopefully both the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SG SGLT2 inhibitors will be approved for type 1 diabetes in the future. I think there are some interesting studies that are being planned, that are ongoing, and also new technologies. For example, Abbott right now is working on a continuous ketone monitor. And it may very well be, if you are using a continuous ketone monitor, the use of the SGLT2 inhibitors in type 1 diabetes will be much safer. So this is where I am from. I love hiking Mount Rainier. You are always welcome to come and visit us in the Pacific Northwest, and thank you all for your attention.